We're coming now today to the end of our time looking at the letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And as we've noted from the beginning, we know that these letters also serve to discipline and disciple the church today. At the same time, these letters also encourage us by reminding us who it is we worship, who it is we have surrendered to. We just sang that. Who is it that we surrender ourselves to? Who is it that we submit ourselves to? It's the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Because it's only through Jesus and his shed blood on the cross that we have the assurance of eternal paradise with him. It was on that cross that he suffered the wrath of God on our behalf so that we wouldn't have to. You know, it's funny, that, that truth, that simple truth, truly is the scandal of the gospel. You may have heard that phrase before, the, the gospel is considered scandalous, but scandalous in terms of the Greek word, the scandalon word, which means it's something that's like a stumbling block to our normal way of thinking. Because when someone does something wrong, they're the ones that have to pay the penalty for it, right? You know, don't commit the crime if you can't do the time. But here, in this case, with God and our sin, we can't pay for it. There's nothing that we can do on our own to set things right with God. And there's two words in Scripture, I think, bring us more hope than you can imagine. But God. But God, in his everlasting love, poured his wrath upon his Son in our place so that we could know forgiveness and we could know God's mercy. And that is why we submit to the Son of God as our Savior. It's out of our thanksgiving, all the thanksgiving that we can muster in our fallen hearts that we honor him with. As his redeemed children, God corrects us. God points us in the right direction. Sometimes that comes across as tough love. And we've seen that in all of these letters. It's because the honor that belongs to Jesus is not to be shared with anyone or anything else. It's not to be diminished in any way. That's why we see so much tough love throughout these letters. His lordship and his holiness demands it. And so we should all be challenged by the discipline in these letters. We should ask God in his mercy to graciously show us our blind spots and our faults, as only he can. And we should heed the call from our Lord to repent of these things, turn away from these things, have a change in mind and heart about these things. If there's one message we've heard throughout this whole series, this whole look at these letters, is that there is to be no compromise. No compromise in our faith, no compromise in the word of God, no compromise in doctrine. Our society would like nothing more than for the church to begin to cherry pick scripture and only hang on to those things that are okay with the rest of the world. Those things that don't bother them. But if the church is called to be holy and the church is called to be set apart from the world, then how does ignoring passages that the unbelieving world doesn't like demonstrate how we take the scriptures, how we hold the Bible to be the very word of God? It's not easy. It's not easy. It definitely wasn't easy back then, as we've seen, and it certainly isn't easy now. In fact, it's challenging for a church these days to remain true to Jesus and a culture that would rather reinterpret or discount scripture, or worse, conjure up an image of Jesus that they're comfortable with. But as is evidenced by these letters, the church is called to worship Jesus as he is revealed to us in his word. The Jesus that is the high priest, the supreme judge, the king of kings, and the Lord of lords. And so with all that in mind, let us now turn to the last letter to the churches, we're in Revelation chapter 3, and we'll be beginning in verse 14. Revelation 3, beginning in verse 14. This is the word of God. To the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I've acquired wealth, 
and do not eat a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would bless the reading of your word to our hearts this morning, that we would be convicted where you need us to be convicted. We would turn to you, we would surrender to you, and we would be blessed fully through your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a pretty tough word from God. (laughs) There's no way to get around that. This is pretty tough. So let's first set the context for us in order to help us understand what it is Jesus is saying here. Laodicea was was a rich city. They were rich. It shouldn't surprise us that like the other churches, it's located on a major trade route. We've seen that in all the churches. Now, I I think there's a little side note here that I think we should know. If someone were to get a lesson in determining the ideal location for planting a church, Revelation 2 and 3 would be it. You want to bring the gospel to where people are. You want to bring it to their places of business. You want to bring it to their homes. The church today needs to take a lesson from that. We need to take a page from that lesson. Coming to church and just keeping it to yourself is not what the church is supposed to do. There were a lot of lost souls in those cities back then, just like there were many, many lost souls in this area today. When the irresistible grace and mercy and love of Christ is shown through the gospel to these souls, God will do an incredible thing in them. It's God's strategy to use the church to live out the gospel and not to keep it to themselves. So, so just, I think, just see that. When we look at where those churches were located, there's a reason why they were planted where they were. So let's, we'll get back to Laodicea. So they were rich. The city was rich. They were known for their banking. They had a large banking business there. They were known for textiles. And they were also known for the Phrygian powder, which was a highly desired medicinal eye salve that you'd put on your eyes. So keep those things in mind as we move forward through this, through this letter. They were an independent-minded people. And here's an example of that. <clears throat> an earthquake hit that city in AD 60. Now remember a couple of weeks ago we looked at the city of Sardis, and they, they had an earthquake hit them, but they accepted assistance from Tiberius, the emperor of Tiberius. Laodiceus said, in this case, no, we don't want your help. We'll do it ourselves. We're good. We'll take care of it. They were self-sufficient able to figure things out for themselves, and they would not be beholden to anyone. But there's one thing they did have to rely on others for, water. There were no springs in Laodicea, and so they built aqueducts from Colossae and Herapolis. Colossae had cold water and Herapolis had hot water. So the easy way to remember this, if anybody asks you, you're at a party some night, and somebody says, hey, how did you know which one was which? The sea is cold, and that was Colossae. H is hot and it was Herapolis. Just keep that in mind for next time you <laughs> want some Bible trivia. <laughs> but in the desert environment, by the time the water made its way through the aqueducts, like five or six miles worth of aqueducts to Laodicea, it was lukewarm. Lukewarm. Now keep that in mind as we move forward. So now, as Jesus does in all the other letters, how does he introduce himself in this one? You know, as we've seen, he uses terms that were applicable to the church he's writing to. So here he declares that he is the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. So let's just break that little trinity of terms down. Uh, In Isaiah 65, verse 16, we read this. He who blesses himself in the land shall bless himself by the God of truth. And he who takes an oath in the land shall swear by the God of truth. It's one of the only times we see that phrase, God of truth. The Hebrew phrase for God of truth, and I know... uh, Nate's going to correct me on the pronunciation here, is uh, Belohe Amen, or Elohim Amen. So Amen is one of the few Hebrew words that actually made its way into Greek. 
In this verse, in, in Revelation, in the Greek, it's the same word. Amen. At the end of a prayer, it usually means to like, let it be so or let it be said. But it also means truth. Truth and truly. And so Jesus here starts off saying that he is the truth. You've heard that before, haven't you? I am the way, the truth, and the life. He also declares that he is a faithful and true witness, meaning as being one with God, his testimony, anything he says is true and completely reliable because he's God and he cannot lie. He also says he's the ruler of God's creation. Now the Greek points to a few things here. One of the definitions of the word is ruler. But it also, something else getting nuanced into this word is the idea of being first or foremost or the beginning. So Jesus is saying that he is the ruler, the first, the beginning of God's creation. So taken together, we take it all to mean that he is superior to all of God's creation who speaks perfect truth because he is truth. That's how he introduces himself to this church. Now, why is this important to them? Well, being rich and independent, the Laodiceans were, were prideful people. They probably didn't take criticism very well. They most likely looked upon anyone trying to assert authority over them with a great deal of skepticism. I mean, what gives you the right to say that to me? Let me look around me. Look at what I've done. Look at what I have. Who are you? Who are you to tell me? And here's Jesus saying, I am truth. I am giving you the very word of God himself and I stand over all creation, even you. So, so, so we get the picture now, right? We get the picture of the city. We get this picture of how Jesus introduced himself to them. And here come the words, I know your deeds. Now, some churches, that was really encouraging to hear, right? The Philadelphia church we saw last week, the Smyrna church. I know what you're going through. I know your deeds. But to this church, not so much. There's no commendation in this letter at all. I know your deeds. You're neither hot nor cold. So let's go back to the plumbing problem, the water problem. Hot water has medicinal value. It has cleansing value, right? Hot water kills germs. It, has, it, can, it, can, it can cleanse you deeply. Nothing beats a hot bath. Cold water in the desert provides refreshing relief from thirst. I mean, think about working in your yard on a hot summer day, and you take that first swig of ice-cold water, or wiping your face with a towel, a cold towel. And Jesus looks at this church because you are neither. Meaning, as a church, you do not minister the gospel to lost souls at all. There's no healing for the spiritually sick. There's no refreshment for the spiritually thirsty and weary. Now, ideally, the church should be both. And Jesus even says it here. I wish you were one or the other. I mean, I wish you did something for the lost and the hurting. Instead, you're lukewarm. The lukewarm water that Laodicea had was, was far from refreshing. It had little medicinal use. If anything, people would get sick from it, and they would spit it out. Because this church was neither, their ministry to the city, their reflection of the light of Christ, their representation of the gospel is about as useless as lukewarm water. Jesus says, I'm about to spit you out. Jeez, spit you out. <laughs> Actually, the, the Greek is even more, it's more, it's, it's I'm about to vomit you. It, it, I mean, talk, you can't get more graphic than that. That's what it says. Now, what I want us to not miss a little, there's a little point here. He says, I'm about to spit you out. So this is a warning. He hasn't done it yet. This is a warning to the church. He's giving them the chance to get their act together. He's giving them the warning to repent, to turn away from it, wake up, and see what's happening. But when you think about what a brilliant illustration for him to use, right? I mean, just, just like he did with all the other things that the churches would have been familiar with. In this case, he uses, this is their water. This is what you live through. I'm going to spit you out like that water. So now that he has their attention... <laughs> It's time for some tough love. We can presume here that this church was a reflection of the city they lived in. So they were a well-off church, 
in a well-off city. As a church, they probably had the same independent mindset. As a church, they probably had some money. Jesus even mentions it. He says, you say you're rich. You've acquired wealth. You don't need a thing. We've seen throughout the series that to, to merely exist in the Roman world, you had to at least be involved in the trade guilds. You had to be involved with the emperor and pagan worship that came with that. And certainly, if you're going to be successful in that culture, success being measured in, in terms of wealth, then you were more involved with that world. You were more than involved with it. You were entrenched in it. But judging by the Lord's words here, it looks like the Laodicean church was heavily steeped in the culture. Today, today we might call them worldly Christians, Christians that have at least one foot in the world, chasing after approval, chasing after success, chasing after money, while maintaining a Christianity that is marginal at best, living like the world around them, looking like the world around them, with no discernible difference. When the people of God chase after worldly riches and gain, and they put their trust in it rather than him, he will discipline them severely. We consider the, the minor prophet Hosea. He was the one who God insisted marry the prostitute. You remember that? And that was to model just how offensive Israel's pagan worship was to God. The 12th chapter of Hosea speaks of Ephraim. Ephraim was, was Israel's largest tribe. They were a very dominant factor in the northern kingdom. And so their, their, their name came to be used kind of like to, to represent the state of the ten tribes in the northern kingdom. The northern kingdom kings were all considered evil. They engaged in Baal worship pagan worship of the neighboring countries. They made alliances with, with non-Israelite nations. And when the good king, Hezekiah of the southern kingdom, invited the kings of the north to come and keep the Passover, the evil kings mocked them, sent them away. There was a spirit of arrogance, a spirit of, of pride. And so in Hosea 12.1, the prophet declares that Ephraim spend, uh, feeds on the wind, feeds on the wind. He pursues the east wind all day and multiplies lies and violence. He makes a treaty with Assyria and sends olive oil to Egypt. The northern kingdom king, kings were all in full affinity with foreign nations. And that's not what Israel was called to be. They were called to be set apart. And in verse 8 of Hosea, we read, Ephraim boasts, I am very rich. I have become wealthy. With all my wealth, they will not find in me any iniquity or sin. They were relying on their worldly riches, almost as if to be redeemed by their wealth, like they could buy their way in. God does not take this lightly. And Jesus, the faithful and true witness of God in this letter, is comparing the hearts of Laodicean church to these things. Their reliance on economic well-being through participation in idolatry, like the city they were in, has put them on the verge of being considered an unbelieving community. You're wretched, you're pitiful, you're poor, you're blind, and you're naked. The wealth they claimed was deficient because it had no eternal reward, because true spiritual richness is only found in Christ. Their self-sufficiency was empty because they need Jesus for everything. We just sang that. We need Jesus for everything. And they were blind to this condition. They didn't even see it. They were pitiful, and they were standing in the shame of their own spiritual nakedness, and they didn't even know it. But Jesus loves them, and he has compassion on them. And he goes right to the heart of their sinfulness, and he offers the solution. Now, remember the three things we talked about earlier that the city was known for, right? Banking, textiles, and eye ointment, right? So follow along here. Jesus says, buy from me three things. First, gold refined in fire, so that you can become rich. Refined in fire represents purity. It speaks of purity. So through Jesus, one receives pure and holy riches, far beyond anything this world can offer. The banks had the gold. Jesus offers eternal riches. And the second thing, white clothes to wear, to cover your shamefulness. So yes, put on the righteousness of Christ. Put on the holiness of Christ and Christ alone, not your own. Put on his. That's rather appropriate to tell a people that was known for textiles. And third, eye salve, so you can see. 
Yeah, they knew the benefits of the eye ointment that they, that they generated, they manufactured, and they sold. But the Lord Jesus opens your eyes to eternal truths. Yes, Jesus gives the believer's eyes to see, and he gives the believer ears to hear. Amen? So the point, the point is this. Putting our trust in the things of this world means we have not put our trust in the Lord. We've made idols of these things, whether it's wealth, whether it's a job, whether it's status, or even ourselves. And just going along like a worldly Christian is to live an unrepentant life. It's to forfeit the blessings of a life that remains in Christ and it dilutes the gospel. The thing is that God, your your heavenly Abba Father, does not want this for his children. We just heard it read this morning from Isaiah 55. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest of fare. Isn't it funny how this word of God spoken through Isaiah sounds so much like what Jesus said? Christ provides an everlasting inheritance. He clothes us in his righteousness. And only he, only he can heal our spiritual blindness. You think about this too. Buying is is something like a transaction, right? We give up something in exchange for something else. Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and let and yet lose or forfeit their very self. We're called to give up self, to deny ourselves for his glory. Give up our will for his. Surrender everything for him. Are you, this morning, trying to save your life? I mean, what has hijacked your heart from fully surrendering to the Lord? What are you trusting in? Is it your money? Is it your abilities? Right? I can figure this out. I don't need any help. What are you hanging on to in this world? What what sin are you not letting go of? Are you compromising the truth? The truth of Scripture. The truth found in His Word by tolerating the sinfulness of the world so you'll fit in. Are you His disciple overflowing with the power of the gospel? Or are you lukewarm? Jesus, the amen, the ruler of creation, will not tolerate any compromise. His holiness demands nothing less. Now, we said this was tough love, right? And it is. This this is tough for all of us to hear. And Jesus said it too. He says right here, those whom I love, I rebuke and I discipline. So if this is making you a little uncomfortable, good. (laughs) That's good. He's disciplining you. That's supposed to make you uncomfortable. And let's face it, every one of us in this room today has something we're hanging on to. If you're going to come to me and tell you, Pastor, I don't sin. Really? Let's have a seat. (laughs) There is always something that stands between us and him. Always. And then you might say, well, hey, Pastor, wait a minute. This letter, he's disciplining the whole church. This is the whole church. It's not me. Oh, Oh, okay. But aren't you in the body of Christ? That means you're in the church. You're part of the church. If the individuals in the church compromise, then the whole body itself will begin to compromise. And so he's calling the church, all of us, to be earnest and to repent. It's to heed the conviction of the Holy Spirit on your heart. Look, look, Jesus loves the church. He wants only the best for the redeemed children of God. For the joy set before him, you know the verse, he endured the cross. And what was that joy? It was the church. The church was given to him. That was his gift. He redeemed the church. He endured the cross to obtain salvation for you. He purchased you. That's the love he has for you. It's indescribable. Absolutely indescribable. Now the next thing we look at in this passage It's usually applied in evangelism. But if we look at it in the context of this letter, it's it's a picture of the love of Christ for the church. 
stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. The layout is saying church, and any church that lives the same way, the way they were, has pushed him out. And yet he still stands there and he knocks. This whole letter, this, everything he says here is the sound of Jesus knocking on the door of the church. Yes, church, you pushed me out. I'm outside, but I'm knocking. I'm knocking on the door. Now, you, you can, and, and Jay mentioned it, and I can't, you can't count how many people have been saved through this, and who am I to say that God doesn't do this? You could use the illustration of Jesus knocking on the door of your heart. You absolutely can do that. But here, the context really points toward he's looking to come back into a church that has pushed him out in favor of worldly things. Now, let's, let's be clear here, too. He's standing at the door. He's not kneeling at the door. He's like, oh, please let me in. It's not what he's doing. He's the Lord. He will not beg. I stand at the door and knock. And if you let me in, I will eat with you. He will fellowship with the church. He will share the bread of life with the church. He will share himself with the church. When the church has Jesus, the church is in full fellowship with Jesus, they can be the instruments of spiritual healing through the gospel to the world. They can be the instruments of spiritual refreshment through the gospel to the world. Is he knocking at the door of this church today? Has our ministry turned lukewarm? Now, don't be so quick to say, no, 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 wait, pastor. Everything's going great. That's not, that's not happening. Stop and think. Have any of us foolishly trusted in worldly things? Do we have an independent mind that really doesn't need Jesus? We say we do, but do we rely on ourselves? Are you tolerant of sin in your life? Are you tolerant of sin in the lives of others that are around you? Is the fruit of the Spirit evident in your daily walk so that others can see Jesus in you? Do you have a heart for the lost? Well, sure I do, Pastor. Okay, great. Have you shared the life-giving gospel with them? Have you shared how sin keeps them from God? Have you shared how the gospel changed you? Let me challenge you with this. Easter, believe it or not, is a month away. Will you commit to pray for one unbeliever in your life? Will you commit to that? Will you commit to invite that person to your Easter service here at the church? Most visitors who come to a church came because they were invited. Do you think that God can do a wonderful thing in their hearts like he did in yours? Do you think that Jesus can heal their spirits and then quench their desperate spiritual thirst? Or are you afraid of what they might say? Afraid they might say no. <laughs> afraid they might think you're a Jesus freak. Afraid they might think less of you. And again, I ask us all, is he knocking on the door of this church? Finally, Jesus says here, to the one who is victorious. And we've seen what that means throughout this whole series, right? It's the, the believer, the one who remains in him, and Christ in them. It's a believer who doesn't compromise with the world, who is his disciple, a devoted disciple of Christ, to that one. And remember, by the way, he's saying this to a church that's lukewarm. But to that person, that believer, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Now, I'm going to say that again. <laughs> if you're a fully devoted disciple of Jesus, he will give you the right to sit with him on his throne. You will share in his kingdom. Now, just, just let that sink in for a second. Just think about that. Do you believe that this is a promise from Jesus? Do you believe that? You think he really means this? Do you? Do you really mean that? Do you really think he means this? Is this real to you, or is it some kind of like a feel-good verse out of the Bible? This is an amazing promise from Jesus Christ to those who have surrendered to him. 
Just like in the Gospel of John, it says that to those who call in his name, he gives the right to become children of God. To those who are victorious, he gives the right to sit on his throne. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was working on this, that blew me away. <laughs> that blew me away. I mean, if he could say that to this lukewarm, worldly Christian church in Laodicea, it means that we all have some hope. <laughs> we all have hope. It certainly causes me to beseech the Holy Spirit to reveal those things in my heart that need to be confessed. I confess them and repent of them and receive the mercy of God. And so the, the letter to the church comes to a close. So what, what have we learned? <laughs> what have we learned through this whole thing? There is to be no compromise in the Christian faith no matter what may come. It doesn't matter. There is no compromise. The church must submit to the authority of her Lord. The church is called to honor him first. The church is called to remain pure and rebuke any and all false teaching that cheapens his grace or dismisses anything in his word. The church is to be alive and not dead. The church is to minister spiritual health to the lost. The church is called to be separate from the world, remembering her first love, Jesus. The church is to repent from anything that stands in the way of Jesus in their hearts. And the church does that through fellowship with Jesus himself. Fellowship with the one who through his grace and through his mercy brings about salvation and brings about the forgiveness of sin. Fellowship by, by living the power of the gospel. Fellowship that desires to live in constant repentance. It's not a one and done thing. We have to constantly repent. But that produces a transformation of the heart and the soul and the mind. That's the church that Jesus will encourage that's the church that will eat from the tree of life. A church that will live in blessed hope of eternity and will one day walk through the open door that Jesus has set before them. A church that will receive that white stone invitation to the great marriage feast of the Lamb. A church that Jesus will give himself to, Jesus the morning star. A church that is filled with the joy of knowing their names are written in the book of life with the name of Jesus written on them. A church that will share in the kingdom, in the kingdom of Jesus. And so let us, let us live for him. Let us commit to him. Let us surrender to him. Let us seek his kingdom above all things. For he is the alpha and the omega. He is the beginning and the end. He's our great high priest. He's the supreme judge. He's the son of God. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of Lords. And he is our Savior. Amen? Amen. I want to just close with one, uh, one verse from Revelation here. Revelation 1, verse 3. Keep this in mind as we go to prayer. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart. And also take to heart what is written in it. Because the time is near. Jesus is coming. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we worship you. We worship you. As, as broken, fallen, messed up people, we worship you. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for who you are. In every one of these letters, you told us who you are, and every one of them means something to us. But overall, you are our shepherd. And as a shepherd, you do desire that you lead us into green pastures, to wonderful places with you. You bring us peace. You refresh our souls. You guide us. And you put us in right paths. Even though we walk through that date of death that we all face, we're not afraid. We don't fear anything because you are with us. We're encouraged by things like this when we see your rod, your correcting rod, and your staff, your leading staff. We're comforted by that. We know too, Lord, that you are preparing 
a feast, an incredible feast that we will all join you at. Lord, you anoint us, you bless us with oil, our hearts overflow. Your goodness and your love follow us. And we are assured that we will dwell with you forever. Lord, we're so thankful for your love for us. We're so thankful for all that you have done for us. And Lord, we do worship you. We repent of what it is we need to repent of. We pray that in your your grace and your gentleness, you would lead us that way. May our hearts be cleansed as we're covered in the blood of the Lamb. Every sin is covered. We're washed clean, white as snow. So thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you, and we seek and desire to serve you with all that we are. And together we're also going to recite the words that that same Lord taught us to pray when the disciples asked him, Lord, we don't even know how to pray. (laughs) So how do we do that? And he says, I'll show you how. (laughs) And that's what we do together. And we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our debts. We forgive our debtors. Give us not the temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.